T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. All three engines up and burning. 2, 1, 0, and Yeah. Lord, this for you. Uh, I was a mess, little hair on my chest Fresh as a newborn, but I'm headed for death Some saying I'm blessed, cause I'm still alive Every day in the hood, I was fighting to survive So sin I quiet as an adolescence Walking in darkness, spirit facing oppression You couldn't tell me nothing, swag was on the honey Speeding in the fast lane, call me crash dummy Then I put on the helmet of salvation and received the revelation Yo, I could be a leader in this nation And gotta follow the code in the streets and be like the mother creeps See, I could be a leader Welcome everybody back to the original Jeep Podcast. We are your host, Rock and Mr. Magic. Unique DNA. Mighty TP. This is the original Jeep Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the original Jeep Podcast. I am so glad to have uh, a friend of mine here with us, Mr. Anthony Gilbert. He is, wow, he's a man of many parts. Um... We, we met um, at an orientation for, for Apple, and we've been in uh, communication you know, since then. He has uh, spent time working for Nike, uh, the, uh, the NBA, and uh, he currently um, writes for Slam Magazine. So this is a well, well-accomplished, well-traveled brother here. Uh, so, Anthony, welcome. Hey man, I, I appreciate you having me on. It's it's a pleasure to to be on with you, man. It, it's just hearing you hearing you run through some of the things I've done. I was just sitting back, like, oh yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta love it. So nonchalant, so nonchalant about it. That's that's beautiful. Um, you know, to be able to to have that. That's that's awesome. Um, so t- so tonight, um, folks, this episode is really gonna be focused on. Uh, not as much on the geek part tonight as it's All Star Weekend, and yeah. uh, with AG um, being a basketball expert in my mind. So if you know why I consider someone to be a basketball expert, but you know their game, uh, we're going to talk a lot here about where the uh, the NBA season is um, and a couple other basketball related topics. Mm-hmm. So first off, I'm going to throw out some quick uh, hitters here for you. Uh, yeah. So just quick responses. One, who is your MVP front runner? James Harden. James uh, Harden, and why? Well, uh, his team ha- has a, a good record, and um, I think that that's a very important component to um, the actual voting and the actual MVP award. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, anybody could be an all-star, a superstar on a really terrible team. Um, but James Harden, his team is exciting. They're playing well. He's the catalyst. And, um, you know, I think it comes down to him and um, Russell Westbrook from uh, Oklahoma City Thunder. But uh, the Thunder aren't they aren't as good as of a team. Um, you know, record wins and losses. So, right. um, you know, Westbrook is doing something that's special. Um, he is currently averaging the triple double, um, which has not been seen since Oscar Robertson in well over 55 years. True. Uh, but I got to give it to Harden, slight edge to his former teammate, James Harden. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick rebuttal. Um, Harden's team does have a good record. True. However,. Yeah. They had a better record under Coach McHale, um, and they I, – I can't – I have a hard time giving an MVP to a guy who's playing for Mike D'Antoni because <laughs> his, system, his system boosts your numbers. His system makes you look better than you actually are. His system made – not knocking the people that he had during that high time with the Suns, not knocking Nash, Amari, Matrix, or Joe Johnson any way. But yeah. the system made them better than they actually were. 
I don't believe Nash was a true MVP. I don't think he should have gotten over Shaquille. I don't don't think he should have gotten over Kobe um, or or a Jason Kidd who was still carrying his team far mm-hmm. that during that time frame or Dwayne Wade um, or Tim Duncan. I don't think he was that good. Um, also, James Harden plays zero defense. I can't give the MVP <laughs> to a guy who plays no defense. I can't do it. Uh, if James Harden pl- made a concerted effort on defense, I probably would lean in agreement with you. Um, Does I, anybody play defense in the NBA right now? <laughs> depends on what you define by defense. Some The current defense, sure. I mean, it's not like, okay, let me, for example, very few people, as we both know, play traditional old school, what we watched growing up as kids, yeah. um, you know, on the ball, hard nosed defense. That's, you know, reserved for the Avery Bradleys, the Tony Allens, mm-hmm. um, those very few old school defenders. Most of these guys play this Allen Iverson defense uh, and play in passing lanes. Yeah. But Harden doesn't even do that. I mean, a lot of these guys at least are sliding their feet. When when James Harden is on Shaq in the Fool every other week because he doesn't play defense and he's letting guys go right by him, that's a problem to me. If you're making an effort and dudes are beating you, okay, fine. Everybody gets beat. It's the NBA. But mm-hmm. when you're letting people buy you, that is a problem. What did you think about LaMelo Ball that scored 92 points in a high school game? I was very unimpressed by the middle ball of 92 points. Um, I watched the tape, and I remember when DeWan Wagner scored 100. Yes. And DeWan, and what Wani did, he actually had to put in work to get that 100. The middle ball cherry-picked half the points. Um, like, they were really just gimmies. Um, I, was just, I wasn't impressed. And when someone else has done that, like, and DeJuan was not even the first to do it. He was one of, like, the fifth to do it or something like that. When you're the fifth person to do something, it's not even that impressive. He didn't score 100. To me, when you've got a bunch of people, over a handful of people that have already done that and done it in eras of basketball that are considered tougher, I'm just not that impressed. I, you liked it better when Cheryl Miller scored 100. Yeah, when Cheryl Miller, she, that was the 80s. Yeah. But she did it. <laughs> I mean, come on. You know, Cheryl Miller did it. And she's, granted, Cheryl's probably the best female player ever. But still, I mean, it's been done before. So to me, yeah. it's not news. You know, the kid's good. I'm sure he'll be a fine college player. And he may make it to the league. But, you know, DeWan Wagner was nothing in the league. And he was the top high school player um, of his class. So... Uh, the 92 points, is it's it's not that impressive to me. Well, it kind of speaks to your your comment about, like, the state of defense nowadays versus how it was maybe 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I, look, I, I'm a businessman. I understand mm-hmm. there is a stronger sense of entertainment towards the game now, kind of like a, a Vince McMahon effect. There's more, and there's more entertainment being stressed in pro sports, period. Football, yeah. too. Um, I understand that the common folk, uh, the casual fan, would rather see a high-scoring game uh, than a 75-74 grinded-out win. Mm-hmm. I personally would like to see the 75-74 because it's not just scoring. There's, you know, there's effort. There's hard-nosed defense, you're, there's people scrapping, there's hustle, there's diving for loose balls, there's, you know, there's every aspect of the game. Um, yeah. It's not a bunch of people just running and shooting and running and shooting, which I guess that can be exciting for to an extent, but when people... I, okay, well, let me give you a real game example. Mm-hmm. Um, the... I want to say it was 1986 when the Pistons and Nuggets had that highest scoring game ever, that 186-184 game. Okay, <laughs> those cats were playing defense though. It's not like they were. It's not like they were letting people go by them. Like they were trying, but everybody happened to be hot. I mean, they had Lamb Beer was hot, Kelly True Pickle was hot, Isaiah was hot. You know, um, Dan Issel was hot, yeah. Alex English was hot. Like everybody was hot. Lafayette. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, John Long had 25 in that game. Like, yeah. everybody caught fire. 
and you had to to keep up because everybody was buckets, buckets, buckets. Yeah. But it's not like they were watching people go by them, not sliding their feet, not you know, not put, getting their arms up. They were trying to stop them, but everybody happened to be hot that game. It was just an aberration. But today we're we're seeing people score the one twenties and one thirties because people aren't even trying defensively. You know, so if you're if they're uh, trying, that's one thing. But when you're not, I was going to say everybody can't be the Pittsburgh Steelers and Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> well, when, you know, no, when, and, when they play, but, but in the eighties, even the eighties, no one, no one, everybody. Obviously, the bad boys were who they were because they didn't have a superstar, but. Everybody, everybody played a similar style to yeah. a certain extent. Everybody but played defense. You also know, like in the AFC, like if the Ravens play the Steelers, you're gonna get a baseball score. Like that is right. not that is not a Monday Night Football game. <laughs> well, but yeah, but which I would love. Why I would love that. You know, I know you. <laughs> I would love it because that that means I'm seeing some facts. That means I'm seeing some takeaways. And to me. I don't know, maybe because being a Pistons fan, you know, growing up in the Bad Boys era, I appreciate defense uh, more than others. I appreciate the strategic part of defense, the chess game of defense, um, which is why I love defensive-minded teams like the Patriots, like the Ravens, like mm-hmm. the Steelers. Um, I, I like the Seahawks. Defense yeah. is such an important part of the game, and to shy away from it, because the casual fan, you know, may want, um, you know, to see a higher scoring game, to me is ridiculous. You're you're going to get people. Are, keep people. People are going to watch. They've been watching for how many years? They're still going to watch. Like, yeah. why they, cheapen yeah. your product yeah. uh, for fear of losing money? Yeah, they're definitely going to watch. I mean, I uh, I love defense as well. Um, you know, we come from that NBA on NBC era. Oh, man, with the greatest theme song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, those are good. Those are good. I mean, you have the Spurs. You have the Knicks. You know, like, you have the Pistons. You know, like, there were so many. You have Miami. Like, you have so many. I can't, Like, I could go on. Right. Like, every, every team in the league, you know, at least had one or two defensive uh, my players and yep. you know and and every team had at least one or two sometimes three superstars this is a good time man you know now well it was it was a great time because the league wasn't watered yeah. down then you only had 28 teams in the 80s or less yeah yeah, yeah. and now you've got what 32 um we got 30 because they, they added orlando and uh Okay, yes, right. So the eighties, so, so most the eighties had, except for eighty nine, had twenty six teams. Because then you added yeah. um, Charlotte and Miami, and then you added Orlando and um, Minnesota and Minnesota. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you added four more teams, and yeah. you know that's that's another that's fifteen <laughs> players per team. So yeah. I mean that's 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 sixty players that wouldn't have been in the league now that are now mm-hmm. in the league you know, watering down the, the talent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's always a touchy subject, but there's that thing that we like to call greed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Just like those talks of, we should have a franchise in London. Um, yeah. And the road trips, come on. Yeah. London's, I mean, what is that? Six. That's like six a six hours. hour flight. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that, yeah. that, that makes no sense. Yeah, it's, it's tricky, but like, it was, but it's so tricky. I mean, I, 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 and I understand the money part, and I understand the NBA makes money hand over fist worldwide. I understand the NFL makes a ton of money stateside. Yes, um, and I'm all for that. I'm a capitalist. I'm cool with that. But <laughs> I just, I wouldn't want to degrade my product just for the for the sake of more and more money, because a poor product is going to cause people to stop watching. And I'm, yeah. at this, and I'm at a point where I really believe that the NBA and the NFL, especially those two, they need competition. There needs to be a, a new USFL or, you know, a, actually not an, not an XFL, but a legit competitor, maybe playing spring football, but a mm. legit competitor to the NFL. There needs to be another ABA and not the current version. There needs to be a legit competitor to make the NBA continue to have the best product. 
they don't seem to be trying anymore. And people forget that the ABA died um, in the in the late seventies. Yeah. Um, early, I think like nineteen eighty was like the last season they had or something like that. Like the golden era of basketball happened because of competition. The same for the NFL. I mean, the USFL in the early eighties. My uncle John played for the in the USFL for the Michigan Panthers. You know, um, they caused a need for the NFL to step up its game. And they did, and now players are getting paid on top of it because they weren't getting paid that much beforehand. Yeah. So competition is good for these giants who have now gotten just so lazy because they don't have any body, you know, veering down on them or, or anybody. No one has them in their sights because well, they're so you know, big. I mean, all right, so <laughs> two things to that. Um, A... There's a lot more money to go around. And then B, um, in football and in, in basketball, and baseball, hockey, all of them, like the rules have changed. In the right. last 30 years, the rules have changed significantly. And Insanely. Yeah, it's so that, you know, it's, it's self-preservation. I mean, the owners... It's like, hey, man, we have a draft every year. We get new talent every year, but we still want to preserve what we have in play. So, you know, the rich are getting richer, man. You know, that's just how it is. <laughs> you know, back back in the day, like way back in the day, I'm going to go back 50 years. I mean, those players – had jobs in the off season. <laughs> True. Yeah, they they did. They, and they were you know, they were regular people who were also playing they the lived, game. They lived in the community, you know. Like, or or we, we, don't, we don't have to go that far back even because it was one thing um yeah that Piston fans knew and we appreciated because that was the mantra of our city and our team anyway, um, you know, being blue collar, but you know, people forget that Bill Lambeer made less money than his dad did. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, he didn't make that much money. And congrats to the Pistons for moving back to Detroit. I'm happy about that. Oh, I, I have mixed feelings about that. Um, but that, yeah. that, that that goes a little okay, they goes a little too far the political spectrum um, because there's a whole lot of tax money being used on that stadium that could be fixing the pipes to, for in Flint, Michigan, right now. Yeah, I hear that. Um, I hear that. And I wouldn't be sending a case to, of water to my friends in Flint every month because they ain't got no clean water still. Um, yeah. So yeah, that, I have I have a personal problem with that. Yeah. I'm going to Little Caesars Arena. Um, well, you need to talk to Dan Gilbert and, uh, you know, no relation, by the way. <laughs> I don't no. think you'd have talked to LeBron the way he did. Um, no. No, not at all. My, I am. I am. <laughs> I'm glad for the city, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, however, I don't think it's necessary for the Pistons to go back right now. Um, the Palace of Auburn Hills is still a fantastic arena. Um, yes, it's you know it came out it was really it came out in '89, so yes, it's got some wheels on it. Um, mm-hmm. And understand that the the Red Wings didn't get it out of the Joe Louis Arena because the joint was falling apart. Um, yeah. A lot of history in the Joe, but yes, there's time for a new arena. I mean, you could always go back to the Silver Dome. <laughs> hey, you know, the crazy car makers, as um, John <laughs> Sally called us, we used to fill that Silver Dome for them, man. Um, but that was a terrible venue for them to I play know. in. That was a terrible venue. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, for, honestly, like you, you could you could play in Ford Field. Like I, I don't, I don't know. I just really think that. Because they had the four as four field, the NCAA tournament looked great at four field. Yeah, it did. I mean, it looked great. I, I just wish that they would um, take their time, take a little time to fix a bit more in the city instead of focusing on getting the teams uh, to this little Caesars arena. Um, yeah, and, I, and the I, fact I, that the taxpayers are footing so much of the bill just irritates me because my home state is a, is a hot mess economically, and you're taking tax money. To, to build this arena, I just I don't think I don't think taxpayer dollars should ever build an arena. I don't care what city or state it is. If you're a billionaire owner, if you you're making an investment into yourself and into your city, you sh- you should not be using taxpayer dollars. 
I'm okay. You know, if they want to give them a tax break for doing it because it's like any business, you're creating jobs, fine. Give them a tax break. But using tax dollars to build an arena, that is a problem. Yeah. And you know what? Like, I didn't know that was the case. And you're right. Over like, over two hundred and thirty million dollars of taxpayer dollars are building the Little Caesars Arena. That's not even supposed to open until uh, the beginning, until the fall of this year, I believe. Yeah, you're right, man. Like you, you, you want to fix the infrastructure and make sure that the people have clean water. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, I would that, think that'd that be a basic takes precedence. Exactly. You think that'd be a basic? Hey, let's let's make sure people that we want to, you know, come and pay money to watch the professional athletes play. Let's make sure they have clean water so they can actually yeah. survive and live to come spend their money here. Yeah, you, you know that's maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm the oddball when it comes to that. No, I'm with you. <laughs> you know, like, but um, speaking of basketball, mm-hmm. the. UConn women are now at a hundred games and ongoing Crazy. on their streak, which is insane. And 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 congr- my congratulations to Coach Oriyama and to every lady that rocked the UConn women's Huskies jersey during that one hundred game streak. You yes. know the uh, the Brianna Stewarts um, and the uh, Maya Moore. Oh, Maya Moore's, yeah. Um, Super. Uh, well, now I'm talking about this specific streak, but all of them have a part of that. Their history, definitely, the Sue Birds yeah. and the um, the Di- Diana Tarazis and the uh, the one who really made a big splash on the map, the Rebecca Lobos. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they all had a hand in this coming to fruition. Um, you know, I, I gotta just congratulate them. They are a, a fantastic program. Uh, but I was thinking about it, and not to compare the two, because you obviously can't compare men and women's um, sports that way. But I was wondering, which do you think is harder, the UCLA 88 men's uh, streak or UConn women's 100 and growing? Hmm. Well, it is hard. That's a, that's a really great question because, I mean – Back when John Wooden's teams were doing it, freshmen couldn't play, you know, so you couldn't get that top talent like a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar right out of high school. You know, you had to wait until he matured and matriculated to sophomore and Bill Walton and (laughs) Walt Hazard, like all those great, great players. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to say they're about equal. Okay, I yeah, thought that it's, as first. It's but... like UCLA is a little tougher because of like they didn't have the the accommodations of like chartered flights and nutritionists and all that stuff. But I always just boil it down to like basketball and basketball is basketball and coaching and you know I'm just gonna I'm gonna say that it's it's a in my opinion I'm gonna say it's about even. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, I'm going to uh, give a slight edge to the UConn women, and I'll, I'll share why. You make a great point about the time frame um, and how things were different, especially that the freshmen couldn't play. Mm-hmm. However, we have to remember that there were Hall of Famers on that team. Uh, multiple excellent players played for Coach Wooden. Um, one big thing is... In, I, I think it separates them is going to be the recruiting factor and the talent levels. Mm-hmm. While Coach Wooten and Coach Ariyama are both were excellent recruiters, the talent level gap from the in the women's game compared to the men's game is not as high. Where Coach Wooten got pretty much the almost the best of the best of that era. Alvin Hayes. Oh, you know, Big E, yeah, Big E in Houston. But he was like like the one of the few that wasn't at UCLA, um, you know, and they end up taking them down. Yeah. Um, but and that was I think during Kareem's um, streak of like sixty something games or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, him and uh, let me see, Don Chaney was on that Houston team as well. I believe you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So when I look at the women's game. 
and mm-hmm. I say, okay, yes, Coach Oyama generally always gets the top talent, except for, you know, very few exceptions like uh, a Candace Parker, a Shamiqua Holesclaw, um, uh, you know, Belle Deladonna um, tend to you know go elsewhere. But you know, Deladonna was going to go there until she felt yeah. she was best for a smaller school. But generally, Harry, he gets Cody. right. But generally, you know, Gino gets the top talent. Yeah. Um, however, the the gap is you know not as great between the top talent and the upper mid level talent in the women's game as it is in the men's game. Because the men's game, you know who the top guys are. They're clearly the top guys. Mm-hmm. Where in the women's game, there's a much smaller margin on that level of of greatness. Um, so you can have a team with one top talent like Baylor with Brindley Geiger, for example, and they can win because their substandard players are actually a lot better than substandard players would be with one star in the men's game. Mm. The, the men's game, you'd have to have a couple players to be able to really separate yourselves like in Kentucky with Anthony Davis and them compared to in the women's game where you have a, a stacked team, but you've got one exceptional player surrounded by okay players. You can get away with that. You can get away with one Skylar Diggins and a bunch of nobodies and go far. You can't well, really... Don't, don't call Natalie Achangwa a nobody. She was good, too. <laughs> she, yeah, okay. I'll give... I'll, yeah, you're right about that, okay? My apologies to Natalie. She, I, I, I do tend to overlook her contributions to that Notre Dame team. Um, and I definitely should not. That that's that's bad on my part. Um, but most people, aside from you and I, people who eat, drink, and sleep basketball, most people do not know Natalie's name. Yeah, um, I agree. Where where Skylar Diggins is a very recognizable name, mm-hmm. and what she did for that Notre Dame program is a lot more recognized. Um, so I, I think that that thing right that right there the talent gap being so much smaller makes it very hard to keep such a lengthy streak going, especially when you are going as deep into the tournament every year as they are as well. Yeah, um, and you have a lot of extra pressure on top of you to to perform. Um, you now, granted, it makes it look. Like they have a really easy time when they're whooping people by fifty, um, but you you know you they they execute, you know. And the women's yeah. game is about execution. They don't have the athletes that the men have. No one's jumping and dunking over anybody, and just that much faster, that just that much stronger. They have to execute, um, and if you don't execute, you don't win. This is what it is. Gino's teams execute. Um, coaching's a part of that, of course, because Pat Summit, God rest her soul, when she was doing her thing in Tennessee, those teams, you know, executed, and that was a, such a great time for women's basketball with Tennessee and uh, and UConn going back and forth and, and winning the championship. Um, sure. But it's it's you rarely have that in the women's game. Generally, you always had a program that was just that much better. In the eighties, it was USC with Cheryl and them. Um, you know, ever ever since pretty much the early '90s, it's been UConn, and then with Tennessee mixed in there a bunch. Um, you, it's, it's a almost a dynasty, you know, almost a dynasty when, it, when you look at it. Where in men's college, it fluctuates a whole lot. It used to be UCLA, and before then it was um, before then it was Kentucky, and then Kentucky again with Patino, and, and then it was UConn for a little bit, and then it switched. Um, and you had a bit of a, you know, Billy Donovan had a good run with Florida for a couple of titles. And, you know, it goes, it goes around. And obviously, Izzo and Michigan State can never count those guys out. Yeah. It's um, the Wild West now because of the one and done. It's just. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and shout out to Coach K down at Duke, you know. But it's just, it's so tough now. So tough. Like, so I, I'm, a, I'm a big UCLA guy. And when UCLA was making it to the Final Four every year, they were doing it with completely new teams. It was crazy, right. you know. They had like Farmar and Aflalo. Then they had, you know, Westbrook, Collison, Holiday, and Love. You know, which, like which the fact that they had those four 
who've all except for who've all except for Carlson made an All Star team, mm-hmm. um, and they didn't win, is insane. Oh, I was gonna point that out. It's crazy. Then you got, you know, Zach Levine. Like you got uh, Kyle Anderson. Like they they, right. they have so many young players that are in the league, and it's like if. Any of y'all would have stayed for two years, <laughs> right? <laughs> o- almost like what um what North Carolina was, yeah. um, In the Dean Smith to to Bill Gut was Gut was there because I always tell people because they tend to forget. I said you realize that if Jerry Stackhouse, Rasheed Wallace, um would have stayed, they would have played with Vince Carter and mm. Anton Jameson, um and Ed Coda. Like yeah. they would have all been on the same squad. Like, yeah. how, like how insane would have that been? Yeah, yeah, and uh, maybe Dante Calabria too. Oh, right? I yeah. can't stand Dante Calabria. Oh my god, <laughs> they, they they loved him in Pittsburgh. I couldn't stand Calabria. He, he he would come up. He would come to this one camp I used to go to when I was in middle school called Born to Run. His dad worked at the camp as a mm-hmm. um, as a referee and you know uh, drill and coordinator. And Calabria showed up and. That year, they changed the colors to North Carolina blue and white because they were so high on Calabria. And I'm yeah. like, this dude's a bum. <laughs> I couldn't stand Calabria. <laughs> I just, I just thought he was so overhyped. Um, I mean, he's not that he couldn't shoot because the man could shoot, but you know, <laughs> he, he, what what he brought to that team was, you know, very negligible compared to what she and Stack were doing. Yeah, sure. You know, I mean, he, he was he was okay. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I always like throwing out those little names like that every now and oh, then. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't blame. Them. I love it too. I always, just, I just always mention the, the reaction. <laughs> yeah, we got mentioned the unsung heroes of, of the college game that don't get the hype. I mean, everyone talks about Corliss Williamson and how he dominated Arkansas, but no one wants to talk about Scotty Thurman or or, or Dillard, who who was like <laughs> Steph Curry before Steph shooting from. You know, just inside the half court line, and, you know, I, I remember watching one game and Dillard brings the ball past past, past half court, and the announcer's like, "Whoa, Dillard's in range!" Yeah, <laughs> and he had crazy J. You know, no one. I mean, Sky Thurman was the best player of that team when they won that title. Corliss yeah. was the better player, but he was Sky Thurman was playing the best basketball on that team. It's nasty. Yeah. And they were well coached, too. Oh, yeah. Were... Coach Richardson did an excellent job with that team. Yeah. Um, and you th- you think about uh, even early Coach Cal with, uh, at UMass. Uh, mm-hmm. People forget about how, how good. And I, I talk about this to, you know, um, to our Puerto Rican brethren who, you know, t- talk about tra- yeah, with Edgar Padilla and, and uh, Carmelo Travieso. I mean, they yeah. were excellent. They were, an, they were probably the best backcourt. In college basketball for tough. two years, they were, they were excellent. Tough. They and were then, good, and then you had uh, Dante Bright. Yeah, and then you had Katina Mobley and Tyson Wheeler up at Rhode Island. Oh yeah, I forget. Yeah, I'm, I forgot uh, Kat Mobley had had Wheeler. Yeah, uh, you, you had some you know really really good, uh, really tough players who just were excellent on their field, and uh, for, you know everybody makes the league. I mean. You know, people forget how good Randolph Childress was at yeah. at, uh, at Wake Forest. You know, yeah. everyone wants to talk about Tim Duncan, but Randolph he ran that team. And when he that game against um, against Carolina, when I think I forget was it, it wasn't Ed Coda. Oh, when he broke Jeff McGinnis and made McGinnis uh-huh. fall, and then he told him to get up and and drain the three. Looking at him, that was yeah. Randolph you know, was bad. You know, Skip Prosser was a really good coach. Um, Wake Forest, you know, people don't talk about them. I mean, the ACC is is a lot different. I mean, you got Syracuse oh, yeah. in the ACC now, which is weird. Yeah, the whole Big East being gone <laughs> is weird. Just the Big East was, you know, it was with Syracuse and, and Pitt and Georgetown. Nova and Georgetown yeah. um, and Miami when they were still in the Big East. And yeah. they were just loaded. Yeah. So top heavy, and now like, oh uh, yeah, it, Syracuse has no business in the ACC. That just makes no sense. It's, uh, it's weird. It's weird, and the fact they don't play Georgetown anymore. It's just it, like, it's, yeah, it's also just weird. It's like, come on. <laughs> now, was, now they're supposed to have like this rivalry with Duke, and it's like, 
it doesn't work. Yeah, it's forced. It's too yeah because they try to make it this Bayheim versus, you know, versus Coach K thing, and yeah, I, I don't care. I, I just want I want to see Duke lose every game to begin with, but oh, well, I don't. <laughs> yeah, see that's 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 one place where we differ, but I. <laughs> I have my I have my reasons, you know, for you know, and my my experience meeting Coach K was not, um, just I didn't I didn't like it. But I mean, I, I hear you. There's always a there's a there's a thing about Duke, and there's always and been that stigma kind, about Duke. Kind of like more house, and you know, um, I don't know. Maybe Coach K put some of that that West Point on you. But uh. <laughs> maybe I don't know. I don't. I don't know what it was. Yeah. Um, I I don't know. It just it did not vibe with me. And you know what? I I I think Duke, Duke reserves the right to recruit the way they want to recruit. Yeah. If they only want to recruit light skinned brothers from prep schools, that is their right. They can definitely do it. It just didn't vibe with me. You know, they they can they can recruit the type of players with the type of backgrounds they prefer. And there is nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Um, I've heard some people argue mm. that they're racist in that aspect, and they don't want to give brothers from you know inner cities a chance and stuff like that. And I'm sorry, they, they have the right to get the type of players that fit their system, that fit their program. They have every right to do so. Well, I don't know how it was back in the day. I do know that that is not the case now. Um, I don't think he has a choice now, though. <laughs> well, I mean, again, I don't know what the criteria is because I was never that good to be recruited by anybody upper echelon. But uh, let's just say I have a really good relationship with the powers that be at Duke University. And, um, you know, if ever you want to give them a second chance, I would love to have you at Cameron Indoor right now. I don't, I don't know. Uh, something to think about. Man. Something to think about. Everybody deserves a second chance. And if I if I go down, if I go down to visit my sister. Yeah. Well, let me know when 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 the thirty for thirty comes out because <laughs> I want to watch it. Uh, I don't know. I, I, my, the only thirty for thirty I want to do right now is on it will be on Bill and Beer because I, I believe there should be he should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, I I would agree with that. I, I was reading something today. And this guy basically was ranking the all-time greats by position. Okay. And shooting guard, he had Kobe Bryant at number six. And I have a problem with that. Uh, okay, well, I need to know, uh, before I know how big of a problem I have with that, I need to know <laughs> who's, who's numbers two through five, because we clearly know who number one should be. Okay, uh, that's a fair question. So, um, he had number one, Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Oh, and I just slapped my that he had anything different. Okay. Okay. Number two, he had James Harden. Okay, that okay. He needs to be slapped now. <laughs> okay. Number three, Oscar Robertson. Oscar was a point guard. Okay, he doesn't know basketball. Number four, Dwayne Wade. That's insane. Number five, Manu Ginobili. That's even more insane. This person clearly needs to be slapped. Number six, Kobe Dean Bryant. This this person's outside their mind. Completely. And then seven is Sir Sid, Mr. Sidney Moncrief. Moncrief, great player. Number eight, Reggie Miller. Okay. Number nine, Clyde the Glide Drexler. Okay. And number ten is... It says Butler. Let me think which Butler that could be. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I have a problem. I have a big problem with that list. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. I, James James Harden? Wow. Yeah. Um, I, there's a whole – I mean, okay, again, terrific talent. The guy can score. Um, how, I love when James I, when Harden, I talk about, but I don't wow. think he's better than Kobe Bryant. When Kobe, I talk, Kobe Bryant's the third all-time leading scorer in NBA history, and he's right. sixth best at his position. Yeah, especially because especially you, you said this is an all-time great list. Yeah, when I talk about all-time greats, I have a criteria 
that's specific because I believe for an all-time great, you should be able to have been successful in multiple eras. Meaning, for every, whatever you brought to the table, you would be able to be great regardless of the rules or the competition level. Mm-hmm. James Harden would have been destroyed in the 90s. <laughs> James Harden would have been eaten alive in the 80s. Well, let me, let, let me give you his small forward list. Cause this is, I got to I take a time out after reading this as well. Because okay. his small forward list is just as kind of crazy as his shooting guard list. Okay. So number one is LeBron James. I have a problem with that, too. Number two, Scotty Pippen. That's, okay. Number three, Kawhi Leonard. Oh, he's insane. Number four, four, Kevin Durant. Oh, my God. Number five. Oh, my God. I also want to know how old this guy is. But number five, Larry Joe Bird. Larry Bird's number five. Number six is Charles Wade Barkley. Power forward. Number seven, Julius the Doctor Irving. That's actually not that unfair. Number eight, Rick Barry. That's actually pretty good. Okay. Number nine, AD from DC. God, I love AD. Adrian Dantley, of course. I love love the teacher. Uh, And then number 10, Paul Pierce. That's actually not too bad either. I don't know if I put Paul that high, but I can understand it. Okay, this person so he put he a, put Paul Pierce above. No, I'm not saying it's right. I can uh, understand. I can understand because of what Paul's done. This this guy's kind of got to be 25 or 22. This guy clearly he might be, like. I mean, I know you're a Michigan guy, Michigan State guy. So for me, the name Ohio State Buckeye is probably sacrilegious, but. I think on that, like, you might want to put, like, a John Havlicek on that. Oh, okay. Just for clarification, my mother is the state person. I'm a Wolverine through and through. Oh, um, okay. So it's even worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Big house. I, okay. Ann Arbor. Yes. In so the you're, big house. you're a big, bad five guy then. Oh, of course. Um, okay, Here, here's – okay, this, this person clearly um, – Either, head. Either, either does not know the game, is extremely young, or wrote this on purpose just to get people like us incest because this is these lists are ridiculous. Yeah, Kawhi um, Leonard. Okay, Kawhi, Kawhi Durant Leonard in your top ten all time. That's that's insane. They not, yeah. only, <laughs> not only have they not played long enough, that's just insane. Um, yeah, like wow. they're, still, they're still playing. Like nah. Like, okay. Well, okay. Well, we, we can't we can't knock that that much because like LeBron yeah. should be on there. Oh, the LeBron should be on the list. Also, LeBron, even though he's still playing, this is also his 14th season, so we have to cut some slack there. And also, we do have to cut some of these guys slack that make these lists because the NBA put Shaq on the all time 50 list way too early. All right. I'm also all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna read you the point guards because oh, am I, I'm, this is gonna probably be worse than the small forwards because a certain Isaiah Lord Thomas the third isn't on here. Oh, okay. oh my God. Okay. You oh ready? my God. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh. All right. Magic Johnson. Of course, he better be. I'm with that. CP3. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Are you going in order from one to ten? <laughs> yes. They have Chris oh Paul my God. At Chris two. Paul over Isaiah Thomas. Chris okay. Chris keep going. John Stockton, which is a very good pick. I like top John. five, but definitely not top three. Steve Nash. No oh, my God. You. No, thank you. Uh, Wardell Stephen Curry. No. I, I love him, but no. Jason Kidd. Yes. Jerry West. Yes. Shooting guard. Yeah, I know. Um, all right, so he has, he has two Jones. Well, one of these Jones is well, Sam, be, Sam, be, Sam uh, Jones, and the other one's probably It's got to be KC. All right. And then... Russell Westbrook. And then he has honorable mention uh, Chauncey Billups and Gary Payton. <laughs> <laughs> but no, Isaiah Thomas. There's, there's just, okay, there's just no words for how out 
of touch this person is. Yeah. Where, so, where did you find this list? All right, so... Was this on ESPN? Because if so, they really uh, need to look I, at their hiring. Let's hope not. Um, so a friend of mine that does write for ESPN, he quoted it and was like, wait a minute. He's like, Kobe Bryant's way too low on that list. So that got my attention. Yeah. Because I'm like, this is somebody that I respect, you know, a writer that I respect. So I'm like, what is he chirping about? Right. So, I, so I'm like, if Kobe, if, Kobe, if there's a list and Kobe Bryant's way too low on it, then I need to investigate. So <laughs> I investigate and Kobe's sixth. And I'm like, huh. Six. Then okay, I okay. Give, then give I me over. give me the power forward list while while we're oh, on this. It's not it's not it's not worth it because he has Karl Malone at six. And oh, no, no, go down. Now, now I have to know. <laughs> now I have now I have to know how terrible this is. Yeah, because Karl Malone, like you don't have to like the guy, but he's not your sixth best power forward. All right, not even no, not even no way. Tim Duncan. Okay. Kevin Garnett. Uh Dennis Rodman. What? Bob Pettit. Okay. Dolph Shays. Uh, okay. Moses Malone, who was the center? Center. Okay. Dirk Nowitzki. No. Carl Malone. Dirk over Malone? <laughs> Dan Issel. Dan was a center, too. And Kevin McCann. And an honorable mention, Horace Grant. Of course, Robert, Grant. Amari Stoudemire. Stat? Oh, my God. Kevin Love and Chris oh. Bosh. And, and Chris Bosh. Yeah. Like, I, I'm not even going to read the sentence because you, you're just going to you're gonna pass out. No, I, I have to. I have to. No, have I don't want to be responsible for I have to have. I mean, <laughs> okay. I have to have the whole thing. I got to have all five positions. All right. Here we go. Wilton Norman Chamberlain. Okay. Uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Okay. Bill Russell. Okay. Shaquille O'Neal is four. Okay. I, 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 I'm okay. With, I'm not 100%, but All this right. list is shaping up better than the other ones. Hakeem Olajuwon is five. Okay. David Robinson is six. That's a little high. George Mikan is seven. Okay. Artist Gilmore is eight. I love Artist, but that's a bit high. Yeah. Pal Gasol is nine. Oh, my God. Now there's no credibility. <laughs> And Ben Wallace is 10. Okay. Pau Gasol is a power forward for that guy's <laughs> information. Um, uh, honorable mention is Arvidas Sabonis, Bill Walton, Wes Unseld, Urban. Uh, don't say Urban Johnson. No, wait, 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 wait. No, this is John's 10. So I can't. I'm trying to move on a blank on John's 10. Let me think. Johnson? Yeah, John's 10. John's John's ten, and then Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing's an honorable mention. Yes, yeah, horrible <laughs> list. What? So okay. you see why I had to. Okay, like, okay. Get no, first, okay. First of all, the the top five is actually reasonable. I would flip. I, I still can't put anybody as a center over Kareem because nobody as great as Wilt was. Wilt did not have as many people his height that he was playing against because he was much taller than Mr. Russell, and Walt Bellamy was the only other real competition that he had. Um, I mean... And he he was so much had, bigger than everybody had, else. You had Nate Thurman. Yeah, Wes Unsell. Nate, Nate Thurman. Nate Thurman. Wes Unsell was 6'7", and his fro made him 6'9", 6'10". <laughs> Wes Unsell was 6'7". We've got point guards taller than that now. Well, Nate, Nate Thurman was the real deal. Nate Thurman was the real deal, but he was also a power forward. And he didn't have to check Will at Austin. And they had to double team the man. Well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. Because this this might be a little entertaining just for my own personal. Who would you say? Uh-huh. If you can if you can't answer this question, because okay. I'm not sure if I could answer it. But who who would you say is the greatest basketball player of all time? Michael Jeffrey Jordan. Tell me why. Okay. Um, there's a couple of reasons why. One, what Michael Jordan did, Michael Jordan, one, to me, he played in the toughest era in basketball history. 
Um, he also, in my opinion, Michael Jordan won with probably, arguably, the less, the least amount of talent. Mm. Um, yes, he has Scottie Pippen, and yes, he had Robin for the last three titles, but people forget that Dennis Rodman is older than Michael Jordan. Um, and Dennis Rodman was not the Detroit Dennis Rodman. He was not even the San Antonio Dennis Rodman. Yes, he was highly effective, and it was foolish for anybody in the league to allow Dennis Rodman to be traded to Chicago. I would have traded for him if my team wasn't even going to play him. I would have <laughs> traded for him just because if you give the best scorer in the league – Another chance to shoot because you're giving him the best rebounder, arguably, in history is just asinine. So every GM of that era is just a giant idiot for letting that happen. Um, Michael Jordan played and surpassed and shattered records against the toughest defenses we've ever seen. Yes, I've exploded greatly about my Pistons. However, they were not the only great defensive team. You have the Celtics. You have the Lakers. You mm-hmm. had a upcoming Knicks team, a very good and overlooked Houston team with Ralph Sampson and Akeem Olajuwon. And a very you good had a very team. good Dallas Mavericks team with Derek Harper and Mark Aguirre and oh, Rolando oh, Blackman. I, yeah. They had very good – people forget how good teams were. That Nuggets team with Dan Issel and Alex Man. English – and Brad Fat Lowe. Lever, excellent teams. Um, Milwaukee was Terry Cummings and Jack Sigma. Um, it's excellent, excellent teams. People forget how loaded most teams were back then. Even the bum teams at least have one great player. But to be as successful in that time where it was still a big man's game, it was not a perimeter game. It, Michael Jordan took a big man's game, dominated by big men like Moses, Kareem, Hakeem, Young Ewing, um, you know, um, you know the Jack Sigmas of the time. But people forget how good Jack Sigma is. He arguably be, could be in the Hall of Fame. Um, the Robert Parishes, the power forwards like Mikhail, a big man's game, dominated by big men since the inception of the game, pretty much. And you had a one man turned it from a big man's game to a perimeter game where now the entire game is a perimeter game where we have seven footers shooting threes and sitting in their tall seven foot selves underneath the rim where they belong. Well, I mean, I, I'm not surprised by your answer. Not at all. I was actually expecting you to say Michael Jordan. Well, most people expect that. My, my, my reasoning are, is generally different because I analyze the impact of what Michael did more than just what he put up. I do, I do, I do admit and concede that he also did win when the league was a little weaker because he did not win until we had in four more teams and teams like my Pistons got weaker because we lost Mahorn to Minnesota in the expansion draft. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and other teams got weaker too because of people retiring like bird, um, you know, with his back problems, mm-hmm. um, and also, the and people also forget free agency had just started. I, I'm sick of hearing these old legends talk about how they wouldn't have left their team to go play with other people. Well, you wouldn't because you couldn't. You, you weren't allowed to. And when it actually happened, there you're already been in the league for five, six, seven, eight years. It's not in your mindset to leave. Where I think 1989-90 season was the first season of unrestricted free agency. And Tom Chambers was the first one to sign a big deal uh, when he went to uh, when he went to, to uh, I think he went to Phoenix mm-hmm. and then he put his mm-hmm. knees in Mark Jackson's chest. Yeah, um, man, Action Jackson. Well, now, that, was, I, that was that was that was well, that was one of the sickest dunks I've ever seen. And it was and they it translated well into Sega Genesis as well. Yes, it did. Um, I I really don't know if I can say that there's one person that is like. Head and shoulders above everybody that ever played the game. Well, I can't uh, say head and shoulders. But if I if I was to answer that question, okay, I would start at Will Chamberlain or Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. See, K- Kareem is my number two, um, but I I have a hard time giving it to Kareem or to um, or to Wilt. 
because of, you know, come on, we both played the game. What's the one thing coaches always tell us? You can't coach height. No. And be when you're got the gift of height, and then you play in an era where no one's close to your size, like Wilt, or you have, or when you're Kareem, and they tell you, you can't dunk the ball anymore, so you take it and you and you create the most unstoppable move in NBA history, probably the most unstoppable move in sports history yeah. in the sky hook, and you continue to actually make your dominance even better because now you're not just limited to dunking the ball, which is what Shaq's dominance was really limited to, and now you're 18 feet away and you're still dominating because your your shot is unstoppable. Um, if Kareem wasn't 7-1, I would say Kareem. But what Michael Jordan did at 6'6", six, six, um, and the extra effort it takes to be able to dominate in a big man's game, but also was still a inside-then-out game, where now we're an outside-in game, or just an outside game in some teams, mm-hmm. it was still taking it to the rack. It was still an inside-out game. For a wing player to accomplish that was outstanding. People forget Magic is 6'9", Bird is 6'10", Mikhail is also taller than that, um, Kareem at 7'1", James Worthy at 6'10", Dominique at 6'8". Um, most of your stars of that era were big men, aside from Mike at 6'6", and Isaiah wasn't even considered a superstar until after they won the championship at a good, what, 6'2"? No one else, <coughs> pardon me, at that level was 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 a smaller guy. Yeah. What he was able to do at his size and being a wing player was outstanding. Well, I'll tell you this much. If they didn't lose to the Celtics every year, we wouldn't even be having this conversation because it would be Jerry West. He was only 6'4". Jerry West was one of the few exceptions. Um, yeah. However, Jer- my, my thing with Jerry West, and he definitely is a lot higher on the, the shooting guard. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> uh, Jerry West. Well, they had him as a point guard. which is Yeah, they had him as a point guard, now, which is He did stupid. play a little point guard. But, he's but a, he, he was a shooting guard. Okay. Yeah. That's, Michael Jordan played point guard in 89, too, but he's still a shooting guard. Yeah, and then they had um, Craig Hodges as Craig Hodges. the guard. Yes. Yeah, and people, for, like, pe- and people forget what Russ is doing now is what Mike was doing in 89. When he was playing point guard with under Doug Collins, he was just wrecking the league. Craziest, yeah. You know. yeah, I mean, um, but, but, I'm not, but, but not Jerry gonna, West, I'm not going to argue um, for Kareem Abdul Jabbar or for Will Chamberlain. Um, that's just where I would start if I were to engage and try to answer. <laughs> if you were to engage in such hyperbole. Yes. Um, the case for Jerry West is definitely a strong one. However, um, as great as Scottie Pippen was, mm-hmm. um, Jerry West had more to work with. Jerry West did play and win with Wilt Chamberlain. Mike never had a dominant player. Even even though he was older, Mike never played with anyone that dominant. Yeah, and he had um, Elgin Baylor. And he had Elgin Baylor. Yeah. And they also had, um, I think... Oh, okay. I don't remember when. I mean, they, they they had some squads. Um, they had they also had um, uh, Gail Goodrich. Yes, the left hander. Yes, I mean the the Lakers were not without talent. Um, <laughs> they had some really talented people. I I think it's sad that Elgin never got one, but um, yeah, yeah they, he, one more year he could have waited. But yeah, um, I mean they Jerry West played with more talent and more Hall of Fame talent than Michael Jordan did. Um, and that's and that's another thing to me. Yes, he had well, good let's, players. Let's, let's think about that. Mike, Mike, Mike played with at least two, and he had a Hall of Fame coach. He had a Hall of Fame coach, but that Hall of Fame coach wasn't wasn't he wasn't anything before Mike. He was nobody. There's a reason why Chuck Daly coached the Dream Team and not um, and not Phil Jackson. The, the same Phil was, Jackson who's running the New York Knicks into the ground, by the way. Right. Yeah, the, yeah, the executive <laughs> Phil Jackson's terrible. Yeah, Phil Jackson, the exec, is horrible. Either that or he's just a Laker plant there to just destroy the Knicks. Yes, yeah. Um, but uh, Phil was nobody. I mean, and, 
and he, he he was nobody. And his first year as head coach, he didn't do any better than Doug Collins did, and they fired Collins. So, and so then they got Bill Cartwright, and things changed a little bit. They still lost. The Pistons still beat him when they had Cartwright. The first year they had Cartwright, the Pistons still beat him. Yeah, and then they figured out the snafu. Actually, no, the first two years they had Cartwright, they they still got beat by the Pistons. Um, but um, I digress. Uh, <laughs> But Mike, but Bill Cartwright is no Hall of Famer. I don't even think Bill Carr ever made an All Star team. Yeah, but um, he was better than what they had. Yes, uh, everybody's better than um, what's that? Uh, I forget his name. I can see his face. I forget his name. Um, yes, yeah, they, 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 Brad Sellers. Yes, yes everybody's Brad. better than Brad Sellers. Yes, and then they um, got rid of Charles Oakley as well. And they well, they traded Oakley for Cartwright, mm-hmm. um, which to me made no sense at that time because he wasn't called Invisible Bill. For no reason in New York, <laughs> um, and Cartwright, of course, you know, you know, because Oakley was Mike's boy, and also, you know, the the enforcer, Bill, you know, Cartwright tried to be an enforcer, which didn't work because he just wasn't that type of dude. Um, but you know, they they didn't, you know, okay, Mike had yes, you had Cartwright. What Stacy King, Stacy King, somebody it's supposed to be somebody. Yeah, but he had he had um, the, he had the worm, and he had again he Scotty, had the, he Scotty. had he had Scotty. He had Craig Hodges. He had B.J. Armstrong, who I think made one all-star team, and that's only because he was there, and he just looked better because he played with Mike and Scotty because when he went to Golden State, B.J. Armstrong was, a, uh, once again, a below-average player. Um, John <laughs> uh, John Paxson was a below-average player who hit one shot in his career that people want to talk about. Scotty and Dennis. Below-average player. Um, Horace Grant was an above-average player who should have been an all-star because he was highly important to that team, but he was not. He was the only other really good player on that team. Um, Bill Wennington was a complete bum. Luke Longley <laughs> was a complete bum. Um, they won with guys, that, 90, that 96 team, you have to remember how many old dudes were on that squad. They had John Sally, who was old at that time. They had... James Edwards, who had also another bad boy, who was ancient. And then Robert Edwards, Parrish, who was 106. Oh, Robert Parrish was a year after, but <laughs> James Edwards was older than Parrish. James Edwards, start, his rookie year was 79, and he had, but he was old when we got him in Detroit. And then he won 2000, and, he, and then 96, he's still playing. James yeah. Edwards is like, he, I think he's the only person who may be older than Morgan Freeman. Like, <laughs> he was crazy old. And they had, um, who else they had that was mad old? Or just guys were bums? Judd Bushler. Come on. Randy um, Brown. I mean, Randy hey, Brown. it worked. Um, Scotty it, Burrell. But it worked. Um, I mean, the, the team, yeah, and, okay, and people want to blow the Steve Kerr like he was some great player. Steve Kerr was okay. He was the man in yes, college. Yes, he was a great shooter. But Steve was just an okay player, a great role player. He knew his role. He knew how to shoot when he was open to hit his shots. But let's not act like Steve Kerr was an all-star level player or even a player of the month level player. He was never that. He was a very good role player. Like, um, a wheeler player that had great talent that they had aside from, you know, an aged Robin and Mike and Scotty, would have been Ron Harper, but Ron Harper's knees were so bad, he wasn't the same Ron Harper. Yeah. Ron Harper had all-star level talent, but injuries got him, or yeah. he would have been a star. But that's it. Tony Kukoc, highly overrated. Yes, he was Europe's best player, but Europe's best player, honestly, was Drazen Petrovic, who has sadly died. Yeah. The only reason why Kukoc was the best player out of Europe was because Drazen was dead. And Vladi wasn't getting the respect he deserved in LA. I mean that 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 team didn't have. I mean they 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 accomplished great things, but they were not that they, they were not overflowing with talent. Mike did that. LeBron could have not taken that team and won. He could have. No, he could have. But, but that's. Well, the, that's... No, there's no way he could have. LeBron wins because this NBA will let you walk across half court without dribbling in the <laughs> NBA Finals and not call it. That's the NBA we're in right, right now, unfortunately, where Russell Westbrook can take five steps before you realize he hasn't dribbled yet. Oh, that was awesome. Like, that—that that is sad. That would have <laughs> – people traveled every once in a while back in the day, 
in the 90s and 80s and 70s, but you could not take steps like that and not get it called for after the third or fourth step. You're taking people are taking five, six step, nine step travels and not getting called. You know, that uh, Josh Smith had that 27 step travel. Yes, yeah, bad that business. That didn't get called. Bad business. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and, and, and somehow, but, but now we have these reports that tell you, you know, when they messed up. That means nothing because you know, the, the, the quality of the, of the officiating has not improved, it continues to deteriorate. Well, let's uh, let let's uh, switch gears for a second. I know you're into sci-fi. Okay. And 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 you're a self-proclaimed geek. Yes. Okay. So the last two Star Wars movies. Okay. Yes or no? Do you like them, or no? You don't like them. Okay, I hate to admit this, but I have not had okay. the opportunity to see Rogue One yet. Um, okay. Money has m- about- money has been tight, so I have not yeah. had the opportunity. However, opening night, I was there to see a, For- a Force Awakens. So what do you think? Okay, I will. I will. Mo- so most of, most like of our listeners. Felt, so you watched it, and then you thought it was 1977, and you had to check your watch. <laughs> Because okay. you were like, wait a minute, okay. I've seen this one. <laughs> okay. They um, like this is the same film. That like that's what you said. I know it. Okay. I I I will I will preface my comments with this. Um, and then you said, <laughs> how in the world does somebody who's not a Jedi pick up a lightsaber and fight <laughs> a Jedi? <laughs> okay. Um. I'm going to preface my comments with this. One, my, our, you don't know this, but our listeners do know this. I am a hardcore Trekkie first, and then yes. and then Star Wars. But okay. because, so. but also, when I went into watching the film, I also had a set of expectations because I understood that we were going to be entered into another J.J. verse. I saw what J.J. Abrams um, did with Star Trek, and mm-hmm. so I was excited. Did you like it? I didn't hate it. I like it. I don't love it like I love most Star Trek. I like it, okay. but I don't love it. So I was expecting a similar treatment from J.J. with Star Wars. Um, I was not a fan of the repetition. Um, I was not a fan of the Star Killer base being a super duper star, a super duper Death Star. Even though they said that it wasn't that, that's exactly what it was. Um, I wasn't a fan of BB-8 being so much like R2. I was hoping they would make <laughs> BB-8 have a little bit more of a different, um, you know, persona, persona. of mm-hmm. a droid because other droids droids have personas. It's been you know widely clear that droids have their own persona. So I was hoping mm-hmm. BB-8 would have a different persona. Um, I liked the movie. I didn't love the movie primarily because of the vast similarities in the fact that to me that's lazy writing the fact that ray and finn all of a sudden became um you know luke and han you know flying through the with the falcon and shooting at things and you know the same the same scene when they escaped the death star like you know that was just that was just too convenient and what about picking up a lightsaber because i know you know the that that is kind of like sacrilegious (laughs) Okay, okay, Here, here's my thing. I I generally do not dive deep into fan theories except for in Game of Thrones, but now into this. I am really getting into some of the fan theories and formulating some of my own. Are you a fan of Arya? I love Arya. I love the Starks, period. I, oh, come on, I'm from Michigan. There we go. Come on, w- okay. winter is always in Michigan. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, always here. It's not coming, it's here. <laughs> yes, exactly. We never say winter is coming. We say winter hasn't left. Yeah. Um, Good old lake effects. Yeah, you know. those three feet, man. But I digress. <laughs> um, so when, I, when I'm looking at Star Star Wars, and I'm watching it, and I'm, in, I, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I'm having a good time. But no, I'm not, I'm not in love with what I'm seeing, but I'm liking it. Um, I did like the fact that Kylo threw a fit. I thought that was hilarious and new and fresh. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I foresaw Han Solo's death only because I knew as a big fan 
that Harrison Ford wanted Han Solo to die back in um, back in nineteen eighty one with uh, with, <laughs> you know, with the um, you know, with the Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. So I I foresaw that. Um, I my theories around the whole end scene with Finn fighting um, Kylo and then Ray fighting Kylo is my personal fan theories. I may be off completely off, but. I believe that obviously they're both. I believe Finn and Ray are both Jedi, are both Force users. Clearly, with Ray, um, you generally never see non-Jedi wielding a lightsaber. The fact that he didn't, he he himself wasn't aware of it, because there are certain things that I noticed that a lot of people didn't really notice. I also noticed mm-hmm. that when Kylo and the other dude, the redhead dude who was super annoying, are talking to Snoke. They mentioned mm-hmm. that there that there had been awakening in the Force. Mm-hmm. That scene happens before Ray shows any manifestation. Mm-hmm. It happens after Finn decides to turn against his mental his brainwashing since he was a baby. Mm-hmm. To reject brainwashing since you're a child, it's got to take some force. Yeah, that's true. Okay, that's true. But also, I mean... well, 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 also, when he <laughs> when when they're when they're, he's talking to Maz or Maz or whatever her name is, Maz, and they're about to fight because Ray got grabbed. He's like, "I need a weapon," and she looks at him and says, "You have a weapon." He had a weapon in the lightsaber, which is a Jedi weapon, and encouraged him to use it. Also, when he's fighting Kylo. He gets a shot in, and it's not like Kylo's just taking it easy on him. He gets a hit in, even though he's clearly not trained. So there's a there's, yeah. So there's, there's I, a lot I, more to Finn there. It's a little, it's a little tricky. Yeah, so there's a lot more to Finn there. Now, what I did not like, and probably just because it was overdone, was uh, Ray's being a prodigy. Her, her just hmm. I've never seen or heard this except for some legends that weren't explicitly, you know, explained to me if I knew how detailed these stories were because Han Solo <laughs> never got the chance to tell me these stories. But um, I'm going to look at you and do this Jedi mind trick that I've never heard of before. Right. Or I'm going to force command this lightsaber to come to me when I've never seen or heard of that being done before. So the mm-hmm. level of her being a prodigy, I was a bit put off by that well they took too much generosity with the fact that they knew scores of people knew and understood the story and that they had like a 30 year start so they were like well well, let's just i mean who cares like there's enough people that's going to go see the film that's just going to fill in the blanks anyway yeah and that's bad storytelling in my opinion it is very bad storytelling so i did like the the relaunch of Star Trek. Okay. Um, I didn't have a problem with with how they casted it and whatnot. I didn't see the latest one. Neither have I, and I'm ashamed to say that. Yeah, but I, I heard it got a little tricky, so I'll, I'll just save that uh, for when you see it, and then we can compare notes later. Uh, I also need to see it, but before I before I, before I get you a little too worked up on sci-fi, because I, I can't go deep on sci-fi like I can <laughs> on basketball. Um, I'm going to ask one last question. Okay. Terrell Owens, Hall of Fame, yes or no? Great question. Mm. Um, I have always been of the opinion that I'm not a big fan of Terrell because I refuse to say Terrell because that's not how you pronounce the <laughs> name of Terrell Owens. <laughs> Um, who, of course, didn't start calling himself Terrell. It was Terrell when he first came out. So anyway. Um, yeah. You know how these things go. Yeah, I know. Branding and all that stuff. Yeah. You know, um, the, the, you know, the NFL's Robin, in my opinion. How, however, I have never been one for denying talent, ever. Um, mm-hmm. Terrell Owens did amazing things in the football field. Uh, Terrell mm-hmm. Owens, in my opinion is a top 10 all-time wide receiver. In my opinion, 
Terrell Owens deserves to be in the NFL Hall of Fame. Same as my case for a Mr. Bill Lambeer. My opinion is this. When, and it's not all the media, because there are other people that vote outside the media for the Hall of Fame. But when you hold a grudge against a guy for what he did to locker rooms, to multiple locker rooms, which is not something that you can overlook. Right. But you weren't a part of that locker room. It's really not your place to hold that against him when it comes to being elected into a hall that's based upon production. This is not the Hall of Fame of good guys. This is the Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. And these guys are in there because of what they did on the field. To me, you can't... You, you, there's no there's no good reason to not have him on there. Teammates that he had beef with no longer have beef with him. Yes, mm-hmm. he made mistakes. Every player makes mistakes. Some to different degrees, but every player makes mistakes. The man produced. I mean, and that's just it. He produced, and yeah, he he's got the numbers. Would I put some a lot of, some other wide receivers above him? Sure. Of course I put Jerry above him. Of course I would put a Randy Moss above him, a Chris Carter above him. But there's not many people I'm putting above T.O. No. You know, um, there's some greats I put below him uh, that I have a deep respect for, like an Art Monk, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Megatron, as great as he was, I will put T.O. above him. Um, You know, there's a lot of really great receivers. Um not many will go above him. Michael Irvin made me go above him, but there's not many. I'm not putting a Brandon Marshall above him, and Brandon put up has put up Hall of Fame numbers for his career. Um, I wouldn't put Tim Brown above him, and I love Tim Brown. Um, yeah. Tim Brown's, in my opinion, probably top 10, top 15 all-time great wide receivers. Yeah. I wouldn't put and him over T.O. He'd have a Super Bowl if it wasn't for the tuck rule. He'd, he'd have a Super Bowl if it wasn't for the fact that John Gruden – um, and Bill Callahan pretty much just, you know, Callahan pretty much threw that game. And John Gruden won on Tony Dungy's. That's Tony Dungy's ring, in my opinion. I don't consider John Gruden to be a Super Bowl winning coach. Um, yeah, that's definitely, definitely. I agree Because that. That, that team coached themselves. They didn't need him. Just like that Barry Switzer, um, you know, Coach Dow's team, team coached themselves. Yeah. They didn't need him. Um, yeah, nah. I, I don't count those. Um, and... You know, yeah, hold on. Gruden's playing the team he just left. He knows he built this team. He knows him inside now. Of course they won. Yeah. Duh. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, T.O. definitely should be on the Hall of Fame. I think it's very petty that he's not in. Um, and it's pretty much because he was the Rodman of the uh, of the NFL. Um, and he, and, you know, or the, you know, the Barry Bonds in the NFL. He alienated so many mm-hmm. people. Uh, with his with his actions and his antics, that they don't want him around. Um, he should be in the Hall of Fame. Bill Ambeer should be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Roger Clemens and Barry Bonds should be in the Hall of Fame. Period. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I agree with all four of those guys. It's it, it just it's ridiculous to me um, how high and mighty some of these people are want to act like they are. Um, yeah, it's it's especially in, in baseball because well, no, you're just ba- baseball and baseball and football. Those are the yeah. two sports where people cheat the most. Yeah, the ratings are high. Like they're not asking the owners or or the networks to give the money back. Like so, don't 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 turn a blind eye when you know everyone's doing it. Oh yeah, and 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 collect the money right, and then become like the archdiocese and say, well, you know what? Now that you're not playing, you can't get in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, I mean, it's... We, we've gotten everything we wanted out of you. Right. And, yeah, we're going to punish So, so it's like, are, are, are we going to keep Bill Belichick out of the Hall of Fame because of Spygate? Are we going to yeah. keep... Is that, is that prevented my team from winning the Super Bowl? Allegedly. But, well, but are, are we... that's, what I, that's what I like to believe. <laughs> oh, but are, are we... Are we going to keep Tom Brady out of the Hall of Fame because of something that's unproven in Deflate Gate? Uh, just for the record, uh, before I run, Donovan McNabb did not throw up in the Super Bowl. <laughs> to me, it doesn't matter if he threw up or not. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> he clearly he was clearly gassed. 
He was he was clearly yeah, you know? he was clearly running on fumes. You know, I I don't know. I've never spoken to him about it. I just want to say he didn't throw up. There was no Willie Beeman going on. <laughs> However, I will say this um, as a as someone who is sympathetic to the Philadelphia fans, as my mother mm-hmm. being a native Phil, uh, of Philadelphia. And half my entire my mother's family is all from that area. So to all the sharps out there, um, you know, you know, I've always supported your love for your Eagles, uh, mm-hmm. your Philadelphia teams. I will say that I, I firmly believe that Andy Reid cost you all tons of Super Bowls um, by making trying mm-hmm. to turn Donovan into a pocket passer in the playoffs every year. He throughout the regular season he'd do his thing, scramble out the pocket, get some yards, show that dual threat, and the defenses were honest. But every time it came to the playoffs, all of a sudden Andy wanted to make Dobbin throw the ball forty times and yeah, stay yeah. in the pocket. And Yeah, he turned turned conservative. Yes. And poor coaching. And 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 the NFL is more coaching than talent. And I've said this for years, and this past Super Bowl proved it. I said the entire two weeks going up to that Super Bowl. I said there's no body more prepared as a coach than Bill Belichick, and no staff makes halftime adjustments better than New England. And I said to several co-workers, you can be up 14 on them. It doesn't matter. They adjust better than anyone else. The NFL is so much more about coaching than it is about talent because everybody's got talent. Not everybody has good coaching or great coaching. I, I agree. I agree. People will get hot. Last year, the Panthers were hot. And they Man, got a coach, though. You got, you a, got coach. a coach. If you can't coach, you're not going to win. Yeah, got to make those adjustments. Exactly. So, um, T.O., Hall of Fame, no doubt. His discrepancies mean, mean little to me in the fact that he produced regardless. He was on a bad mm-hmm. Buffalo team, and he produced. He produced for Philly. He produced for the Niners. Um, he produced as an old man in Cincinnati. Um, there's, there's no, there's no way he should not be in the <laughs> Hall of Fame. Uh, I, yeah. think it, I think it's completely asinine um, that we have to have people. We have to have this conversation. It, it is really a, a travesty, and to me, just ridiculously disrespectful for a man that you know you don't have to like the guy, but at least show the guy the uh, a modicum of dis- of respect and acknowledge the fact of how great of a talent he was and, and 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 put the man in the proper place where he belongs amongst the other great wide receivers and great yeah. players in NFL history. It, yeah. The fact that we have to wait till next year, um, and who knows, who knows what they'll do next year. They they may be jerks again and not put him in, who knows? But he, he should be in and and I, I like the fact that he put the stands that you know what, he doesn't need their validation. And I'm glad because I think he knows what most of us know, and that he belongs in there. Absolutely, he does. Uh, so huh? I'm gonna leave you. I'm a. I'm a, I'm a I pre- you've been with me so much longer than I intended, and I pretty. Pre- I really appreciate it. So I'm gonna leave you with one quick thing, one quick mm-hmm. hit. I need, I want your opinion on. Um, yes. So we are about to see the end of an era, as there's only three players left in that 1998 draft still in the league, between Paul yes. Pierce, Vince Carter, and Dirk Nowitzki, and you know. Paul's hardly playing, um, so the only one actually, the only ones getting any burn are Vince and Dirk. Mm-hmm. At forty years old, mm-hmm. we have seen Vince continue to be Vince um, in his you know final years here in, in Memphis. There was a rumor, unfortunately, didn't come to fruition that Vince may have was possibly going to be considered to be invited to be in the dunk contest. How special would it, would it be for the league to have invited Vince to dunk? And what, do you think if they would have invited him, because I think they should have, would he have a shot at winning? Well, I definitely think, you know, to, to follow up on what they did last year, because last year was special. They had a dunk off for the ages, one that we hadn't seen in a long time with Zach Levine and Aaron Gordon. You really really thought it was that special? 
I think it was special because they have been so terrible. Like, so terrible. Like, I can't tell you one that I remember, you know, in recent history. Of course I remember Michael Jordan and Dominique Wilkins. Of course I remember that. Of course I remember D. Brown, you know, covering his face. You know, of course I remember Kobe Bryant, but, like, those weren't, those weren't battles. Like, you, you did have a battle between Jason Richardson oh, and, and, and uh, Mason. yeah, like, you, they, but they weren't, like, Dominique and Jordan. And what I saw last year was almost, almost, it was, like, the same neighborhood as Dominique and Wilkins and Michael Jordan. So, that was fun for me, and I think Ooh, that's high. That's high praise, right? Yeah, there. yeah, it was fun. They they were going at it, and they were getting creative, and they were making their dunks. You know, so uh, you know that's also okay. that's also a big part of it. Because when they missed the, when they missed eighteen dunks, and then they yeah, they make even, the nineteen. Don't even get me on that with Nate Robinson. <laughs> don't even. I love Nate, but there's no yeah. way you win when you miss <laughs> the dunk that many times. Um, yeah. So, but if they had they had they really like tried to push Vince and like, hey Vince, come on, let's 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 do it all over again seventeen years later. Like that would have added some a nice a nice little wrinkle to this weekend. Um and from what I've seen Vince Carter from this year, you know, like in person, uh I went to a, a Memphis game this year. Um I think he, he think he, I think he could warm up the bus to, to to throw it down and 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 compete with these young guys. I really do. I, and and he would be the favorite. I think he would too. I think like he he still has enough spring yeah. where he could. Uh, and obviously, it's not going to be two thousand again. But I believe with the spring he still has and his creativity, he could beat these guys. Like you you talk about last year. Okay. <sighs> I was not – Zach Levine, yes, he can get up. I mm-hmm. don't find him that impressive compared to Aaron Gordon just because I've seen Aaron Gordon take off off the dribble. I've seen mm-hmm. Aaron Gordon catch it off the bounce. I see Zach Levine do nothing but catch it off the bounce. And to me, that is lazy dunking. I, you can do it every <laughs> once in a while, but everything you do is you toss it up and you catch it off the bounce – I, mm-hmm. that you're a one trick pony to me that has some slight variations. I, I just, I, I'm, that does not impress me. When I watched Vince Carter in 2000, he caught some off the bounce. He did some off the dribble. He did the pass. He ran, you know, he did from out of bounds to do, you know, the windmill. There was a mixture. Same with Jay Rich. I mean, even though he lost that one year, that mm-hmm. reverse left hand off the backboard, Yo, I, I don't know if I've yeah. seen a better dunk in the dunk contest. Like, yeah, there, Jay, Jay Rich is, he, <laughs> yeah. There, I mean, there was, there was, there was some, um, you know, there was, there was a mixture of what Jay did. Even Desmond Mason, I thought he was a substandard dunk champion. Yeah. He, he, Fred, uh, Fred Jones. Fred Jones. They, they, yeah. I, I don't think, I don't think Fred Jones should have won, but there was some mixture. Like, they, 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 they did multiple things. Well, well, what happened was, they judged that that year when Fred Jones beat make, Jay Rich. Was it Jay, um, was it Jay, was it Jay Rich? He yeah, beat, yeah, he Desmond beat Jay Rich. Rich. They they were judging it how you were supposed to judge it. And what happened was Jay Rich missed. That's his right. He dunk. missed the one dunk. Yes, right. And that's why. That's why Fred won. Fred Jones won. Right. Now, had it been those rules when um, Nate Robinson won, then yeah, it would have been totally different. Right. <laughs> Yeah, but and the fact that Jay Rich knew he could win and he still did that dunk and to me because he did probably the greatest dunk contest dunk ever. You should be like just give him the trophy, Fred, because no one thinks he won. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I think that Dr. J in '76, I think um, Michael Jordan. I want to say that was in '88. '88. But see, but see, Dominique got robbed. Dominique did get robbed. But they were in Chicago. Chicago Stadium. Right. So, um, Michael Jordan in 88, Dominique in 88, and then I'll go, um, 
then I'll just skip all the way over to like. Oh, see, I mean, how, how, see, 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 D Brown was good, but he wasn't how, great. How are you Kobe going to pass? Good. How are you going to pass up Dominique and Spud Webb in '86? Oh yeah, okay, okay. You can't. That, that was a battle. That was a good one too. Um, but then I got fast after '88, and and I got to fast forward to to 2000. Well, see, no, 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 you can't, you can't. Here's why. You, there's, there's one dunk contest that you're overlooking. You mentioned Kobe. You mentioned 2000. There's one you can't overlook that really, in my opinion, kind of rekindled a whole lot of things. Um, well, yeah. And that is uh, 1994. Mr. J.R. Ryder. Minnesota. J.R. Ryder. Yeah. The, e- okay. the East Bay it's, Funk. It's, it's Bay the East Funk Bay down. Funk <laughs> revitalized a contest that was starting to die. Because Mike had stopped doing it after 88. Neek was mm. too old to do it. And we didn't have a big star. And we were looking at younger players who try to provide some spark because um, we, it just wasn't, it wasn't really there again because Mike wasn't doing it anymore. And we had, we had some people try, but it wasn't working. And they started to whittle down the, um, the amount of contestants. The fact that we have four is ridiculous. You used to have eight. And now, yeah, now there's four. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the and the the less you have, the less creativity is for. So I think they need to go back to that to the eight guys anyway. But when Jr. Ryder did something we had never seen on the NBA court before, that's that's true. Now now you, you see people do that dunk. They go under their leg, and that, now it's like now it's whole yawn. Home. Yeah, people yawn. Yeah, like, ah, whatever. But, but, but you're right. But at that I but will, at that I point, that. Jr. Ryder that. did something we had not seen before. And remember, because that was the same dunk Kobe used to win, yeah. and Kobe Kobe's wasn't as good as JR's was. Yeah, Kobe won in 97 with that same dunk. Right. Yep, yeah, I agree. That's a great point. And then Vince That's Carter in 2000, where Vince did the best overall performance in yeah. dunk contest history. Yeah, I think, and, and you know, I know we're going to wrap up, and I appreciate the time, but I think that Vince Carter is the best in-game dunker of all time. For many years, I debated this um, because I personally would my prior to prior to Vince Carter, it was mm-hmm. very apparent to me that it was Dominique, closely followed by Dr. J, and then David Thompson. Uh, okay, I knew he was going to say David Thompson. I was waiting. Vince Carter, so Dr. J had those smooth, just float on you and then I'm yamming on you. Dominique was all about the power. He really never had mm-hmm. those Jordan, Dom, you know, Dr. J style dunks. And DT was uh, above, way above the rim. Yes, yeah, so far above the rim because he was so he was he was, t- he was short, so much smaller than them. But that mm-hmm. power in his legs and when he just attacked the rim so fiercely, like. He was doing Russell Westbrook's dunks before Russ was. That same ferocity, um, and just destroy you. I'd never seen anybody do all of that before. Vince Carter, Vince would float right by you. He would two foot ramming on you, three sixty doing the double pumps in the in the game, the windmills. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he and the fact that he wouldn't challenge everybody um he the uh, countless times he dunked on Matumbo, ewing morning robinson yeah. um i mean he caught almost everybody if you were in the way vince was gonna get you uh, i mean he you know, jumped over, over and, 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 and when you foot. jump right. and even though it's international <laughs> competition so it's weaker but when you jump over somebody um yeah there's there's that was that's 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 the best dunk I've ever seen, uh, in yeah. game. Close close behind it is when Dominique destroyed um, Bob Lanier with mm-hmm. that two handed and Bob Lanier apparently didn't talk to Dominique for like fifteen yeah. years after that. Yeah. Um, like there's some and, and then Dr. J on Bill Walton in the finals. Um, there have been some great dunk ons, but Vince Carter had the entire package. He did everything he did. to you. And that and that uh, was it was his sophomore year. It was his rookie year. It might have been his rookie year where he had where he went baseline against Indiana. 
Um, I I just I've never seen anybody do what he did above the rim. Um, <laughs> it just it was it was amazing, and he played, yeah. and, and thankfully he did that at a time where the league wasn't so wasn't watered down um, to a point where there weren't enough rim protectors. Because now I I don't get that impressed when people are doing it and attacking the rim. Um, because just the, the amount of rim protectors are, are are just is so scarce, you know. Right, and and the playing of defense is and the very and the playing of defense is scarce. But <laughs> but Vince was doing this on Hakeem and on Robinson and on Duncan yeah. and on an older Ewing, but still Ewing. And I think I don't know if he caught Shaq, but I mean he was doing it on Rasheed Wallace and Ben Wallace mm-hmm. and all these all these staunch defenders. And he was just in Matumbo, who was still in his prime. Like he caught, he's just boom, boom. And you couldn't, you couldn't stop him. Um, he's the best man. He was the best in game dunker, period. And what he yes. and what he's been doing at in his advanced age in Dallas in Memphis, um, uh, amazing. You know, it's, yeah. And that dunk he did all morning when he was in New Jersey. Oh, oh that that man. that. Cause he got he got bodied him and went higher yes. and then dunked on him like, like I love that one oh, I love that that's one of my favorite oh man I was like Zoe and and, and Zoe you can always catch reverse, Zoe because he reverse always jumps yes the, on, on a breakaway on like, a breakaway oh I don't even get me started yeah I mean me Vin, Vince could and that's why I wish they would have done something like that to appease us older fans who are the really ones still putting money in the NBA's pockets. That would have been nice. To have Vince one last send off just to, just to, just to show respect for the man who kept the dunk contest being something to talk about, but uh, just, just amazing. And I would like in my, my dream dunk contest competition. I mean, he's, He's got to be my favorite, even though you have Mike in there. You've got Dominique. You've got Dr. J, J. Rich. Yeah. Um, you you got to give me Vince. You, you got to give me Vince. I, I just, there's never been someone who just owned a, every dunk. Sean Kemp had great performances, but every dunk wasn't great. You know, yeah. Dominique and Mike had great performances, but every dunk wasn't 50 worthy. Every single dunk Vince did was a 50. Yeah, I mean, it was just it, it blew it blew me away. I yeah. and to this day, seventeen years later, I watch that video and I'm still in awe to this day on on what he did. It's just I, I there's there's no other word. Vince Carter by far. I mean, he, he'll be a Hall of Famer. He's got enough numbers for it. Um, he'll yeah. be a Hall of Famer, probably like a second or third ballot. But what he did. For for especially for that franchise in Toronto, and on that dunk contest was just by far the one of the most amazing feats of of athleticism I've ever seen. Yeah, no question. Oh, thank you so much, AG, for joining me tonight. Definitely gonna have to have you come back um, another time here. Yes, sir. This episode of the Original Jeep Podcast is brought to you by Single and Anxious, the new YouTube web series. Single and Anxious follows five African-American college students from various backgrounds as they fumble their way through the challenges of establishing and maintaining romantic relationships. Check it out on YouTube. Again, it's Single and Anxious. You can find uh, information just at www.singleandanxious.com. So, folks, that wraps up this this program for today. Again, thank you for the support. We love you. And until the next time, peace.